So the data I presented here was about drugging with a new inhibitor known as inhi entrectinib, the TREK fusion proteins that are increasingly recognized as validated drivers of multiple kinds of cancers in both adults and in pediatrics. So entrectinib is one of two very front-running inhibitors being developed to drug TREK fusion proteins that are activated by chromosomal translocations. Extraordinarily interesting, extraordinarily rare in most cancers. In my world of sarcomas, they happen to be enriched in certain undifferentiated sarcomas as well as gastrointestinal stromal tumors and related spindle cell malignancies that are not driven by other kinase activations such as mutated KIT or mutated PDGF receptor alpha. But we're finding these uh, in lung cancers, in certain types of breast cancers, salivary gland tumors, thyroid, pancreas, cholangiocarcinomas, all over the place. And what's fascinating is that when you find a fusion, we can drug it and the patients get really remarkable levels of benefit in general. The presentation I made here was on entrectinib. It followed a presentation with the other kinase inhibitor known as larotrectinib. And both of these are pursuing very rapid clinical development towards commercialization in both the US and Europe. OK, well, could we get into some of that results data then? Absolutely. The thing that caught everybody's attention were the high levels of objective response rates you see in a tumor agnostic manner which means that very similar responses can be seen regardless of whether it's a sarcoma, a lung cancer, a thyroid cancer, breast. If the fusion is there, they seem to have the same type of ability to respond. Now, recognize that the data so far is based on 54 patients because these TREK fusion patients are so hard to find. But just with the larotrectinib data having both expanded and uh, enhanced its data set with a year's worth of extra accrual, we're seeing the same thing happen with entrectinib. With more uh, patient recognition of that, patients are asking their physicians for this sort of molecular testing. Physicians are looking for these patients more, so we're finding more. With entrectinib in particular, it's an interesting drug because it was designed to actually enter the CNS and lead to anti-nervous system coverage, which is particularly important for diseases like lung cancer, which has a high propensity to go with metastatic spread into the central nervous system. So what's fascinating in the analyses I was able to present today is the high levels of objective response, more than 55%, 57.4% to be exact, um, and that's likely to go up because patients over time can develop these responses. A number of patients who were in the safety database were not eligible to be evaluated because they had not long enough follow-up on the drug yet. So these numbers are very um, mobile. We saw that as well in the larotrectinib data because they uh, presented longer term data and in fact response rates went up because people had time to mature their responses from sometimes stable disease to a partial response over time. With our data, the duration of response in general has not been reached, the median duration has not been reached, which means that half the patients have not had failure of the drug yet. That's always a good thing. I think a lot of physicians look at the data and say, how come you didn't report duration of response? Well, if everybody's still on the drug, it's hard to respond in a median way. So that's exciting. And then the other important thing is that the patients responded regardless of whether or not they had metastatic disease to the brain, which is extraordinarily unusual in cancer trials. First of all, cancer trials that even allow patients who have CNS disease to enter at study baseline are often not allowed into such clinical trials. So it's exciting that this trial was able to accrue patients with metastatic disease in the brain, and it's even more exciting for those patients that they had essentially an equivalent chance of having anti-tumor efficacy in their brain as they did in the systemic spread of the disease. That sounds like a wonder drug, which makes me wonder where things might start to go wrong. The first being toxicities. How is it being tolerated? So the TREK inhibitors are extraordinarily well tolerated. It's remarkable. Uh, the side effects are a bit of fatigue in some people. That was uh, very well tolerated. A bit of anemia, a bit of weight gain. Interestingly, these drugs can actually stimulate appetite in some people, and that can be an interesting side effect that we've not been used to dealing with in cancer medicine before. So um, other than that, the patients have actually enjoyed being on these oral medications. It's really quite remarkable. Well, I guess 
we have to wait to find out more about it because it sounds very promising. When can we expect more data from this trial or any others? We're, we're seeing an incredibly rapid evolution of data in this field, partly because the patients are staying on the drug, so it's easy, easy to continue to build the database when the patients are all remaining on the trial. We do expect resistance, let's be honest. This is a kinase, and just like with other kinases, like the kit-driven GIST diseases that develop resistance mutations, uh, even before this went into humans, we predicted what the resistance mutations would be in laboratory studies. And in fact, on any waterfall plot, on, on one side of the waterfall, you see all the patients whose tumors are shrinking. There's always three or four patients on the left, unfortunately, who had the disease continue to grow. And with all of the data, one should always ask, what's different about those patients? Well, several of those patients had resistance mutations at baseline. And I think that's the kind of data that's going to be much more commonly accessible, and that's the data that's going to help doctors really fulfill the wishes of precision medicine, to get the right drug to the right patient at the right time, and to understand who might not benefit from a drug like this, and then find the right drug for those patients. Already we're seeing in the laboratory many interesting types of drugs be developed to overcome resistance in the TREC kinase. So, uh, as we're, we're going to see at every meeting right now, we'll see more follow-up on these patients and likely much more experience with new patients who are going to find their way into these and other expanding trials so that we can learn more about them. The other interesting thing is that with any kind of a disease agnostic drug, if this drug works regardless of cholangiocarcinoma, sarcoma, lung cancer, whatever, Physicians are still going to look at it in the eyes of physicians who are specialized in lung cancer or sarcoma or colorectal cancer. Or if they're not specialized oncologists, they'll say, well, I'm interested for my patient who has a cholangiocarcinoma. So they're going to focus in on that part of the curve, as they should. So I think what's going to be interesting is as we develop more data, how we really get that data out and educate physicians so that they can make wise decisions with their patients about how to use these drugs, what to expect with them, what the risk factors are, and what the, uh, the uh, long-term prognosis could actually be. It's fun to talk about long-term prognosis in patients with metastatic cancer. I still have some of my patients who first went on Gleevec for metastatic GIST back in the year 2000. It's 2018 right now. And they still visit me in Boston once a year, still on Gleevec. That's only about 10 or 12% of them, but still the fact that it's possible means that some people can do extraordinarily well if their disease is genomically stable. With the TREC inhibitors, we think that the pediatric diseases are likely to have a more stable genome, so we're hoping for the good of those kids that they will be able to remain on these drugs long-term without long-term side effects. Is there anything else that you would like to say about entrectinib at this point? Uh, no. I think for the world, the most exciting thing is that we have now seen two very effective kinase inhibitors, entrectinib and larotrectinib, both of which are very well tolerated, and both of which should hopefully find a way of finding their way to the right patients. I think the challenge with these is how do we find these patients in a cost-effective way that's sensitive to society's needs. We can't spend two million dollars to find one patient. That's just not sustainable. But I do believe that technology will find an answer to this. We're bringing down the costs of next generation profiling of tumors to the degree that it's much more affordable than it was even five years ago. It's going to get even cheaper next year. And then we'll use other kind of technologies to try to hone in on exactly who these patients are. For example, in GIST, I can tell you where these fusions are not going to be found. If a GIST patient has a kit mutation, you don't have to look further. There will be no TREC fusion. If a GIST patient has a PDGF receptor alpha mutation, there's no fusion. So what's easy to say to people is if you've got a GIST that has no kit mutation, no PDGF receptor alpha mutation, no mutation in BRAF, and no deficiency in the succinyl dehydrogenase, the SDH system, that's known as a quad negative GIST, and those are the ones where the TREC fusions are going to hide. So that actually gives doctors a lot of guidance about how to screen in, in that particular rare disease. We have to do that level of detail for lung cancer, for cholangiocarcinoma, and all the others.